Teachers College, thank you for having me and our panelists, who I'm going to quickly, well, you've met Anard, who is one of the spearheaders of this amazing um, curriculum. Uh, we have Dan, who is probably the most important voice in journalism talking about financial literacy. Um, we have Stacy next to me, who is one of the top personal finance writers who takes complicated information and makes it accessible to everyday people. And we have Carol Loomis, who I have just to take one second and say, I am the hugest fan of this woman. She is perhaps, and I would say pretty, pretty assuredly, the most uh, accomplished business journalist in the country in our time. Um, she has interviewed the titans of industry, and she takes complicated information and makes it understandable. She's super tough, but also super nice, Carol Loomis, <laughs> who I met many years ago when I was in my 20s, a writer at Money Magazine, and you spoke to us, and I am so honored to be here with you. Okay, so we all agree kids need to learn about money. Uh, a recent international poll, uh, actually study, found that three out of four Americans aged 15 years old, so some of you might be close to 15, about that, um, don't understand the basics of even a, a simple pay stub. They can't dissect it. They don't know what it means. And that's why your work and your work is so important. Um, it's interesting, uh, my dad studied at Teachers College in the 1950s, and he was telling me this morning on the phone that in the 1900s, personal finance was taught as a section of math. When you learn math, you learn basic personal finance. And then it, toward the 1950s, personal finance was incorporated into civics classes and social studies. But today, it's basically disappeared from our classrooms and as we know, teachers really need to learn this information. Fortunately, we have this great panel, so I'm gonna launch into the questions. The first is critics of personal finance in the classroom argue that there's no evidence it has a long-term impact on students' behaviors. They say kids learn it today, but then they forget about it in a few years. Others say um, that really the only example that matters is your parents at home, so why bother teaching it in the classrooms? Could you comment on that? Well, first of all, the parents often don't don't know what they're doing either, uh, uh, and so they're setting a bad example, uh, um, which is one reason a lot of financial education thought today is we want to reach the parents through the kids, and, and you're going to do that by introducing the concepts in school. Well, I would say that, that at, um, at, at Fortune, um, a lot of the writers at Fortune really didn't like to write about financial subjects uh, because it just wasn't what they were what they were good at. They were good at doing uh, profiles about business people, but they would steer away from the financial subjects. So even at that level, uh, you were you were finding that many people were not comfortable at all with uh, with finance. And I heavens among my friends, I, I know so many that that were. Any names or now we'll give another. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll keep away from names right now. <laughs> it's interesting that um, the critics would say that what kids learn in school is lost, because I think. Um, one of the big failures of financial education, one of the big failures of financial journalists, one of um, just an issue that we really have to take seriously is when you're talking about money, you're not talking about money most of the time. And when you make that link to kids and show them how money can be one of your best teachers because how you treat it reflects a lot how you feel about yourself, it reflects how you feel about your gender, how you feel about your race, how you, and it reflects what your parents taught you, what was important to them, and once you really help people make that connection, then you'll see money needs to be reinforced at school, at home. It's just like teaching a kid good study habits. It's constant. And I just um, applaud you guys and um, what you're doing at Teachers College. And I, for me, the real turning point in my career and my life and in the financial education curriculum that I created was to really make people see that we're talking about a lot more than dollars and cents. Hmm. The problem, the, there's an inherent problem with the premise is the problem is because we've been focusing on didactic materials where you just remember like the rule of 72 it's about compound interest like who really cares I mean what who cares about the war like you know in history parallel who cares about the war of 1812 right you can look at you can google anything now 
right? And so going back to what Stacy had said, if you think about it, connecting to people's real lived experiences and how that plays out in their daily lives and with engaging materials and think about the concepts rather than knowledge base, then I think you would change, the, um, change that premise. You know, I'd like to add, too, that financial literacy as a thing is really only 20 years old or so, give or take. Uh, it's way too early to say it works or doesn't work. And, and really, what's the alternative to just not do it? Uh, that doesn't make sense either. Um, I think we're starting to build a body of evidence that shows it is effective. Uh, um, the critics want more. We have to give it to them. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to be everywhere. But uh, we're getting there, and, and I think we just got to stay with it. Just to share a story, I, um, to show you how powerful financial literacy is and how much we're talking about something different, I created a um, financial education program that's in high schools, and I kind of sat in the back of a class in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and it was the discussion about gender and money. So they have a boy and a girl come stand up in the front of the class. We started with a case study of how the men and women are treated differently when they go into a car dealership. And um, we said, who's going to get the better deal? And everyone, you know, they kind of knew why the woman would get a worse deal because of the stereotype that women aren't as good as money. But I, the question my curriculum asks is, why does she fit that profile? So then we talk about gender scripting, as I call it, for women to be providers and protectors and for men to really identify themselves with money and how we kind of buy, buy into that. And everyone can see the women's stuff. When we get to the man's side, we start with a Cambridge University study that shows that men actually go into a physiological depression six weeks into unemployment. And just goes back to their provider protect instinct that they've been schooled with when they can't do the one thing that they value themselves doing that really has a physical impact. And this kid raised his hand, and he's like, maybe that's why my father left. Mm. And then this girl raises, I love when kids get going, and this girl raises her hand. She's like, you know, I think it was lions. When the male starts taking resources, he leaves the group. And we talked about how that's instinctive in animals. So in groups, men will leave. And we talked about the bigger social impact. So it's just great to really get, we're talking about that stuff when we're talking about money. So I, you know, with my work, I try to get people to take that part of the conversation as seriously as the numbers. Sorry. No, that was <laughs> an amazing story. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask the next question. If you could teach one thing to kids or grown-ups sitting here, parents or grandparents, what would be the lesson you'd want them to learn about personal finance? Now, before I ask this question, I have to say that Carol told me yesterday in an email, you know, that's a good question. I'm going to call Warren Buffett. Do you guys know who Warren Buffett is? <laughs> Only the most successful investor ever in the world. And Carol is pretty much best, really good friends with him. They Two talk friends. daily or for often. Long, for a long time. For right. a long time. So Carol is now going to tell us, share with us, I think, I think she got the call through to him, what the best piece of advice he offered. Well, actually, I had remembered one. I was just wanted to refresh her course on that. And the other... Um, I had forgotten, and um, so I'm going to tell the other, because it doesn't have much to do with financial literacy, but it, it, it has a big point. Um, and it, well, he gets up there on the stage talking to Omaha high school students, and he does this uh, periodically. And the first lesson, which is the one that doesn't have much to do with financial literacy, um, he says to them, we're going to engage in a little imagination here. We're going to imagine that at the end of this program today, I give each of you a car, and I'm going to give you any car you want, um, some of those that uh, Justin was uh, mentioning uh, <laughs> earlier. Um, and um, he said, but you're going to be able to pick your car, but it's going to be the only car uh, that you're ever going to have. So he said, what are you going to do with that car once I give it to you? And I guess he got a little audience participation, and they said, whoa, you know, we're going to really be careful with that car. We're going to take it to the best dealer. We're going to make sure that it's always got the right fuel, always oiled correctly. And I'll run out of uh, technical uh, descriptions of cars very soon. <laughs> and um, um, and they, they, it, it, so the general message was we are never going to let anything happen to that car. And now he said, now I'm going to tell you what the analogy is here. You were only given one body. And you're going to have to spend the rest of your life uh, dealing with that body. 
So I want to tell you, go out there and do it, uh, do it correctly. Okay, now the financial literacy part. He said, if I give you one piece of advice, and there will be people on this stage who I suspect will say you're being irrational to even suggest this, I would give you one piece of advice. Never get a credit card. Never get a credit card. Spend all your cash that you want to, but never reach into the credit card world. He said, if I'd been paying 12% interest on a credit card, I would not be where I am today because I could not, you know, 12% interest on a credit card is an incredible target, an incredible jump to get over. So that was his main point to them. And I bet there are a lot of kids in Omaha who remember this. That's amazing. I actually walk around saying that and be like, who are you? But now knowing Warren Buffett says it, that's amazing advice. And don't worry about your credit reports because you'll have student loans, probably have a car loan. You'll have enough of a credit report. Great advice. Remember that. Oh, Thank wanna, you. I want to add just one thing until somebody argues with us on this. Uh, when we moved to Westchester County and I started making friends basically my age in their 30s, I ran into one who was married to the president of a small New York bank. So we're not talking about anybody who was penniless here. She had no credit card. She would had some terrible experience early in their married life that had made her think that she should never, ever do that. She bought everything with cash or with a check, and if she couldn't do it, she didn't buy it. So here's the part where I say Warren Buffett is wrong. Okay. <laughs> Actually, not. I mean, I can't say that. That would be ridiculous. It's, it's, it's just perfectly good advice. But, it, you know, the thing that I would say is uh, delayed gratification is kind of like the main one. Learn. It, it goes hand in hand. Go without the debt if you can. Wait. Teach, teach people or learn how to wait to buy what you want with money that you have, not with money that you borrow. Uh, that's number one. And then there's a one, there's a one A. And, and uh, saving is really very simple. This is, this is something people don't understand. Saving can be very simple. Uh, uh, if, you, if you automate it, uh, you know, you, the minute you go to work, you join a 401k or some plan like that, you sign up to pay yourself first with whatever sounds like a reasonable amount to you, you automatically have your employer raise that by 1% a year until you're saving 12% or 14%. And you put all of this money into a target date mutual fund and go live your life. And when you're 70, you're not gonna have any issues. I guarantee it. Um, you know, that's simplistic, but it works and it's much better than doing nothing. I would definitely say don't let money make you forget who you are and um, detach money from character judgments. Um, so it's interesting, the issue of debt. I, um, Ariana Huffington was speaking at a National Association of Black Journalists conference, and she just blew, just totally cracked me up, especially as a financial um, journalist. She gets on stage, she's like, what is with Americans in debt? <laughs> She's like, if it wasn't for debt, my mother raised me and all these kids by herself, and I went to college and I got these, these, these experience. She's like, what is with Americans in debt? I'm not that extreme about debt, but I love the fact that she was clear on it's the meaning you make out of something. And again, when you look at things like, I look at things like how your gender, your culture, all this play out in your financial experience, you have to, it's, see money as a gift in terms of what it can reflect back to you, where you might need some work in your life but never ever get into the character assassination, like people who have debt are bad, people who are rich or don't have problems, or just to make, separate that link. So I'm gonna add on, I'm gonna disagree a little bit. I, there's, I think we're oversimplifying debt, because there's good debt and there's bad oh, debt, right? So I think depending on the circumstances that's available. So if you're taking debt to go to college and you're going to have a return on investment on what you major and what you do, and we know that college graduates earn more than undergrad and then high school graduates and so forth. So there's that type of debt. We're talking about consumption debt, right? That's the, what, that's the credit card we're talking about. There's, there's you know, debt to buy a house. You need a place to live and you have that equity that's building up. That's good debt. And most economists would argue that too. So I think we have to think about think about bad debt is one of the things, right? And so in terms of taking out bad debt, the lesson is like don't try to keep up with the Joneses, right? That's one of the things. And it's hard for teenagers, and it's for hard for kids, especially when you see the you know next kids sporting the next you know the newest 
Air Jordans or you know the newest backpacks and the newest cars or whatever or the, the newest houses. It's hard for grown-ups. Exactly, and it's hard for grown-ups. But and that's one of the lessons I think is try not to keep up with the Joneses. I mean that's just not. It's really hard to have behavior change, but that's one thing we know does make a difference. In addition to that, I'm talking about our relationship with debt. For example, I just spoke to um, a group of students at Ryder College, and a, a Chinese girl came up to me after, because in Chinese culture, debt is very, very, very bad debt of any kind. It's really not distinguished. And her parents were giving her a hard time and wanted her to not go to college because she'd have to take out student loans. And she was having all of this anxiety by thinking this, you know, student, you know, debt, just saying debt is bad. And I was like, no, there's different kinds of debt. You have to understand that this is a part of, this is cultural, that you, your culture plays out into your attitude about debt. So you have to get clear on your goals and priorities and step away from those messages that might not serve you. But it's, uh, the debt, it's a complex relationship because there is some character issues in it as well, but there's good debt and dad, bad debt, and your kids just be clear on your relationship with debt, and again, don't let it be a character assassination, whatever it is. Okay. Yeah? Please. One more question. Oh, one more, oh we have time for one more question. Um, let's see. So, uh, you both, well, you two have created financial literacy curriculums, um, and you two are so smart. <laughs> what do you think we need to do as a nation to get young people more aware of what we're talking about, the importance of issues like um, Justin and Lauren taught us about? What, 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 what's the obstacle here? We all agree this is important. What's the obstacle? How do we move it to the next level? Well, I think that uh, Joyce's program that she set up, <clears throat> and um, I mean, it, it sounds wonderful. I've learned so much about it tonight, and to to hear uh, about the Tucks, what they've done, uh, it sounds to me like the real inroads are being made here. It's going to be slow, I would think, but nevertheless, there are inroads. Yeah, I, I think it's a tough question. I mean. Uh, Someone noted the 800 or some odd programs that are out there. We, it's a it's a disparate effort right now, and partly it's the result of the educational system, which is run at the state level. And um, there are countries that have the ability to mandate uh, federal educational roles or curriculum. You know, are are doing this. Uh, I think the UK is doing it. I think maybe Australia and Zealand, uh, New Zealand right. are doing it. Right. Uh, but we can't do that here. So. We need we need some leadership on this, um, and I, I don't know where it's going exactly where it's going to come from. Uh, um, there are, you know, the Consumer F Financial Protection Bureau is is, is active. Uh, you know, the uh, the presidents on both sides of the aisle have been behind this, um, but the leadership isn't there yet, and someone's going to have to to grab this and run with it. I think we're going to have to change the messaging a little bit and um, have how we look at money and really acknowledge that money is a behavior and to treat it as such. We're treating it like it's um, more comes from our intellect than actually our emotions and our behavior and um, really change the messaging around it. There's an interesting app called Acorns that I've done a lot of reporting on because my son has it. And it's every time you use a debit card, um, it rounds up. Like if you bought something for $9.50, it'll take 50 cents and it'll invest it in the stock market. And what this has done is made investing accessible to you know, so many people who wouldn't have been in the markets. I discussed it on a popular show called The Breakfast Club, which is a popular uh, radio show in the minority community. And it just so many people are now playing in the markets. And the, it was started by a father and son. The son um, and his friends in college wanted to invest, and they didn't have enough money. And he said one of the things that he's noticed is people investing small amounts. They think of investing as ownership and not about growing wealth and how much differently they look at it once they have that pride of ownership. So I think we just have to change the messaging around money and treat it as what it is. So I want to go back and, and think about this, put this in context, right? People have been um, writing in the, since the early 1900s about people don't know history, like American kids don't know history. They don't know who the presidents are and all that. 
there's the same parallel. I mean, financial literacy jumpstart and the whole push towards financial literacy only started in the early 1990s. That's been around. That's most of the recent work to do that. And so I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a problem in slow motion that I really do think, and I would be working in this faculty at this university, um, this college, doing this work, thinking about that education does make a difference. And that the education of the teachers, I think, makes a huge difference because there is that ripple effect that goes to not only to the students, but also to families and to their peers and so forth. So I think this is, it's a long battle ahead, and it's not necessarily, a, you know, it, it's, a, it's a problem, a crisis we can solve easily if we put a concerted effort into making sure that we educate um, all levels right. of our society to do that. And I want to end that with one comment. Um, my favorite person, although Carol has interviewed, all, everybody here has interviewed great people, I got to interview Elmo. I was on Sesame Street, and I got to interview Elmo and teach Elmo about money. And it was a special Sesame Street did. And what was really amazing about it was that they showed this program to a million families, and then they were able to test it. They were able to see, they looked, they did a randomized controlled study, and they found that the kids who watched the program with their family, not only did the kids learn very basic concepts like saving, but the families actually saved more money. They saved like 50% more money than the families who didn't watch the show. So that's sort of a good lesson, and that's what great teaching, of course, is all about. You're teaching children, and they're bringing those messages home and teaching their parents. So I'll. And with that, thank you so much. Thank you to our amazing panel. Thank you.